everyone, and welcome to Knight Foundation Discovery, our weekly look at the arts and its impact on our communities. Uh, I'm Chris Barr, Director of Art and Technology Innovation at Knight Foundation. And today we're going to be talking about open source tools for creative expression and art making. And our guests today are Shane Holloway. She's an artist and director uh, or professor rather at um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago and at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And Chris Coleman who is Director of Clinic for Open Source Arts and a professor at Denver University. Welcome to you both. Hey. Thank you very much, good to be here. How are you all? So we have a lot to unpack, right? So the, the, the title for this is Open Source Tools for Creative Expression. So we've got a lot in there. We've got open source, we've got tools and tool making, and we've got ideas about art and creative expression and folks who make art using digital tools. And, and I wonder if we could start at the, the top and just talk a little bit about uh, this space of digital creation and, and where these tools sit within it. So, um, you know, I think uh, uh, we've been thinking a long time about um, what it means to have control over the the sort of set of brushes or, or tools that you use to make your artwork and how much, um, how much your very work and the things that you can create, that content itself, how much that's shaped by the tools. And so like using a tool like Adobe Photoshop means that while it's you know, nearly limitless in its possibilities, it also does have limits and those do shape what it is you can create and what it is you're putting out into the world. And so there's something about this sort of other ecosystem of open source tools um, that uh, allow you to see both sides of how it's made and how it can be used. And that opens up the possibility to make your own um, and really start to make, you know, make the custom brush that's really going to serve what it is that you want to uh, express. Uh, and that's really sort of the core notion that um, I think digital technology enables, um, but you know, other, other kinds of art technology uh, enable that as well. Ours is just a little bit more complicated in some ways. Right. And, yes. And, oh, go ahead, Shani. Cool. I was just gonna say, yeah, it's so true. And I think they're, you know, one of the reasons why open source um, software and other kinds of um, bits and pieces that are made fit so well in the artistic community or people who wanna be creative is because also, you know, you get the chance to um, have sort of a feedback loop with the folks that might create um, that software or that hardware, whatever it is that you're using. Um, where, whereas you don't with Adobe, you know, um, there's this thing about like, if you design um, for everyone, you design for no one. Um, and, you know, these kinds of big, big, bigger corporations are necessarily designing for kind of everybody, but with these open source tools, it can be really niche because a lot of them, I think, really come out of this need for, um, you know, one thing to happen, right? And and you they get to listen even a little bit closer uh, because maybe their motivations aren't money. Um, and artists, I think, really especially gravitate towards this um, because we do need really specialized things um, or creative people. We need specialized things to get the job done, but also um, we want to be able to have a say because I don't know when the last time it was you talked to an artist, but we don't really do anything that we're supposed to do or what we're told to do, <laughs> and especially if we're given something, we definitely don't want it. So <laughs> Right. You, you want tools that are easily broken and, and exploited in, in new ways. Or we want them to stay the same. I mean, that's another thing too, um, the maintenance of these tools. Um, Adobe Photoshop is a really great one um, where you know, there's a whole movement of, of glitch artists that were making um, you know, and breaking things within Adobe Photoshop that now a lot of the versions with a lot of the um, pro safety protocols can't, you know, we can't do that anymore. Um, so you know, there's lots of opportunities. So, so we have, artists who are working with, with technology and uh, really interdisciplinary um, uh, models for, for making things. And um, even what to call this field that, that ranges from creative coding to new media art to uh, things that are hard to define uh, is tricky. Uh, and we know that there's a set of tools that are often uh, supporting that. And, and I think that's, uh, 
a piece of what we want to talk about today. Um, for, for those who aren't aware, when we say open source, uh, open source on one hand is a licensing regime, right? It's, it's a set of permissions that we put on uh, a piece of software. Uh, on another hand, it's, it's a structure by which you might uh, think about community and you might think about how things get made. Uh, so so could, could we talk a little bit about why open source and why those models are so attractive uh, for people who are, who are creating art uh, specifically? Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, Shawnee really got to one of the most critical parts is that, you know, um, many times there's a tool that maybe only 50 people in the world want to use. Um, and so like, how does that get made? Like, the, you know, no company's ever gonna make that tool. They're never gonna make their money back uh, developing that tool. But like one or two or 10 or 15 people can sort of pull their efforts together and create, and then most importantly, maintain a tool like that um, by combining their efforts. And, and um, also understanding that, you know, open source isn't a sort of fixed set of people that it's a sort of flow of people coming in, finding a tool, using the tool, helping make some changes, and then flowing out to maybe another tool. And that sort of fluidity and, and um, understanding that people are coming in and out of a project and moving through it, that's like why open source is so essential that like, you know, I, I, I wanna do a, a specific project, like let's say I didn't make this beautiful artwork behind me, but let's say I wanna make something like this and I want a tool that really makes these beautiful patterns um, and I want to add a new feature to it and I think other people will like it. Well, I can see that code. I can offer that feature to the rest of the community and you know, maybe they'll accept it. Maybe it'll be part of the tool going into the future. Uh, and then maybe I move on to something completely different, um, but that there's other people who come and continue to sort of carry the load of keeping that thing functional and useful or not. Like it's okay to let them go too which again is another sort of beautiful part of this ecosystem. So, so you, you are both artists and uh, this is sort of pretty abstract right now. And I'm curious, uh, Shawnee, could, could you talk a little bit about how these tools find their way into the work that you create? Yeah, I mean, I think a little bit to follow up on what Chris just said too, there's a, a number of um, aspects of dream dreaming um, with the open source community ethics, um, hopefully, <laughs> in my opinion, if you're doing it right, there is. Um, and this dreaming is a necessary um, sort of collective dreaming um, that can happen. And I think with artists, you know, comes mentorship. Uh, and, and for me, at least, these tools have come into my hands through mentors or through people that I've trusted or people who are trying to help me out or say like, oh, you just graduated from college and you can't afford, you know, your Maya anymore or whatever, like here, use Blender or, um, you know, try the, try Wick Editor. It's really cool. Like you can just get started really fast, um, prototype that thing, right? Um, that dreaming extends also to, um, you know, oh, you feel like this interface is really like oppressive here, maybe try this tool. It was made by someone who might be more like-minded to you. I, I love this idea that um, open source arts is about collective dreaming, right? That, that together we're gonna think about the world we wanna create and we're gonna make the tools to, to realize that and we're gonna do it together. Um, you know, I think so often, you know, we think about, um, both in, in especially the visual art world and in the software world, this idea of the solo genius. Uh, and, and I think a, a lot of what you are talking about is, is um, community, it, it's about togetherness and how do, you, how do you manage projects and realize a future together. And, and in a lot of ways, this is, becomes really important. Um, and so your work with the Clinic for Open Source Arts is really about how do you nurture those communities and how do you help these projects along. Chris, could you just talk a little bit about what that effort is and, and, and the work that you're trying to do there? Yeah, I, you know, the Clinic for Open Source Arts came out of me being a professor who teaches with a lot of open source tools. I, 
I, I, as Sean A says, like, I, I feel it's really important to put my students as young artists into the world with things that they're going to be able to for, afford to continue to use just at a base level. Like you've just gotten done paying for college. You, like, can you afford to pay for the tools that you're going to continue to work with is a real big question. But um, so I, I think that initiated me on this path of like, how do I support these ecosystems? Uh, because some of them are like amazing and some of them I'm really worried about, right? You know, we talk about sustainability quite a bit. And um, so the question became like, how do I use uh, my institution, my sort of base of knowledge to think about that? And how do I, you know, uh, connect with other people? Uh, at notably Golan Levin at Carnegie Mellon University, the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Like he's been doing this for years. Uh, trying to help different open source projects uh, be realized and sustained. So we, I really thought about the Clinic for Open Source Arts as a clinic in that we're thinking about the health of these tools that we rely on every day. Um, and so like, what does it mean for a tool or a project or a community to be healthy? Uh, you know, it means that it needs to have a diverse group of people working and thinking about what it is. Uh, it needs to be welcoming to all different kinds of contributions. Uh, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to not have people burn out and, you know, burn the project down in flames because they can't deal with the stress anymore. Um, it, uh, and it needs to help projects that whose time has passed and it's time for them to sort of sunset. And even what does that even look like? Um, so many of these topics have been talked about, maybe in some regard for bigger open source projects, more generally in computer science, but I feel like by focusing on tools for creativity, we've got a very different kind of community. Um, and it enables us to have, um, frankly, some much more progressive conversations about what it might look like for open source, uh, especially for artists, but I hope actually these lessons can cascade out to other um, projects as well. Tools that may be not targeted at artists, but artists also leverage, and are certainly also leveraged you know, at museums and other spaces. Yeah, so, so absolutely, as we think about um, art and technology and how it's supported through those in, uh, institutional structures, on one hand, uh, you are both in, um, uh, universities and you're teaching courses, you're training uh, a next generation of artists who are, who are using uh, specific tools um, and maybe learning about how to create and be a contributor in those communities. Uh, the artwork that gets created, and I think one of the things that's interesting, especially code-based art, is often uh, it's not just that the tool is created to make the thing, but the, that the code is, is often running the project as well. So there becomes a conservation issue long-term if we want to think about how some of these things run in the future. Um, and so there's, there's a lot there as we're thinking about uh, what becomes critical about um, these individual tools. Uh, but I like the teaching element because I think one of the things both of you are, are working on is, is the teaching element. And that's not just in uh, the classroom, uh, but it's also within the community. And so uh, I'm curious if you can speak to how do we teach these tools uh, to people who are curious, people who want to start making uh, things with P5JS, with uh, processing, with other tools that are, that are available, um, and, and how we think about this idea of turning someone from uh, someone who's interested to becoming a contributor, and what are the various ways you think folks can contribute to that? I mean, I think one really easy answer to this is just do it. Like, you know, as just teachers, do it. Just yeah, literally there just do it. it. You can't I mean, break it. For real. It, it's, um, it really bothers me sometimes, um, especially in the academy, where people are like, oh, we can't do, we can't teach open source. They have to know this for their jobs. And I'm like, it's, first of all, we have a standard of how to use a computer, how to use an interface, right? It, you know, 
something as basic as if you can't find it, go look in the documentation, Google it, or look at the, you know, in the menu, it's a, ba you know, there are familiar objects within these open source tools. I think a lot of people find, feel like open source is so far away from anything that they could possibly ever relate to, right? But in, in reality, a lot of these things are just copies of what you can pay for, but just a little bit more customizable. And um, with education, you know, there's a, there's a canon. And I think right now we're in a moment where we're starting to say like, as professors, am I brave enough to like go against this canon? Um, and personally, you know, no one checks on me <laughs> really in my classrooms. I can do whatever I want. And so, you know, we have these opportunities as, a, as people in authoritative positions to start putting these foots forward, foots feet forward. Um, and, you know, I always say it only takes one person to, to care about a student or to say like, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? It only takes one minute with one person. And um, in my opinion, yeah, that's just, that's how you start with open source. Um, but you yourself also in the classroom or as an older, as a parent even, have to be open to understanding a new language. Um, and I think that, you know, radical pedagogy, which is what I hope folks are leading with in the classroom, really starts with this openness and um, modeling that for, for even children, um, you know, university, you know, we're, all, we're gone by university, you know, like, you know, we're in our step. But, you know, modeling that for children young um, is also important um, to the way that our, the future of our, even internet and, and computers will go. Um, you know, we need to think about the next generation and the more that we use open source, the more that they're going to be able to change the landscape of, of how we navigate. Great. I always yeah. love the, the notion of like, oh, it's industry standard. And so like, we have to train them for it. But the funny part is, is it's industry standard because the last group of students that were taught were taught with these tools. And so like by choosing to teach those tools again, you're actually perpetuating that standard. And so like, if you want to see change, it actually has to begin here, <laughs> like at the educational level, because that's how people walk into a movie studio and say, actually, I can do all this with Blender and you can not pay the $10,000 Maya license. Um, and all of a sudden that studio is going to be reconsidering what they're doing. Uh, and it, so I, I love that notion of change. And I, I'll just double on the other part of your question, Chris, which is like, we actually live in an amazing age of like YouTube and Twitch and like, you can literally learn anything now. Um, and uh, you know, I'm thinking about Erin uh, Davey. She's got cozy coding over on Twitch where she just sort of like, talks about and codes with people uh, while chilling on her bed amongst her stuffed animals. And, um, and, and you know, learning to code that way is a really sort of beautiful, um, a, a beautiful way of, of thinking about getting into it and being comfortable with dabbling and playing. And then it becomes more and more serious as you have ideas of what you want to execute. So, so as you think of the tools available to artists, creators, folks that want to tinker right now, what, what's the sort of starter kit uh, for folks who are watching that, that want to know what toolkits are available to them that they, that they can go and download and play with today? I mean, uh, we've, heard, just... we've heard you mention Blender. We've, uh, I, I mentioned P5.js and, and processing, which is... Uh, a specialized uh, library for, for artists specifically. Uh, but there, are there other tools, big or small, that, that you think are really neat that people might need to know about? Definitely. Um, Twine is something that, that's like the first thing that I always teach in my classroom um, because it sets a foundation for understanding HTML and CSS. Um, and then we move forward from there. And um, for me, that was, actually even still is probably one of the only fluid languages or those two are the only fluid languages that I know um, along with JavaScript but once you know HTML and CSS you can kind of move also on to p5.js learn that structure and then move forward from there to kind of scaffold a, a solid programming um, sort of knowledge. And uh, of course we have been thinking about this question quite a bit over at COSA and uh, actually produced a series of videos uh, just last month uh, called the COSA Connectors, where we asked uh, open source curators or journalists, I don't know, they're somewhere in between, uh, to do little two minute movies introducing a lot of these fantastic tools. Um, you should definitely check that out. Um, if you want to just 
hear about some of the cool options uh, because in fact there are so many and and you know as a digital professor i'm always like well tell me more about what you want to do and then i can tell you some tools that might help you do that um just because there are thousands like there's <laughs> one that's for making zines uh you know there's ones that are for drawing pixelated cats uh <laughs> it's <laughs> it really uh it goes up pretty long way. And, and I think it also depends on whether you want to do something like creative coding, which is really for generative art or um, creating quick uh, animations or maybe even doing interactive things and interactive interfaces. Whereas uh, you might also want to use something like Inkscape uh, that's going to allow for, uh, that's more like Photoshop and you're just doing photo manipulation. So, um, the span really is there. So, so for folks watching, I, I'm going to say stick around because we'll, we'll see a clip of uh, one of these COSA connectors uh, videos with Shawnee talking about uh, the project that she mentioned, Twine, uh, and there, there are more online on YouTube. Um, I, I want to get to, you know, thinking about open source and this idea of free and what is sort of being spent uh, in the creation of of these projects, right? Um, you know, open source is a paradigm that's about um, a license that allows you to alter source code. Uh, and people often put those tools out on the internet uh, for you to download and use for free on, on the monetary side. Um, but in order to create them, folks are volunteering their time uh, often. And so the ability for everyone to volunteer their time gets into sort of questions about power and resources uh, and, and ability to, to participate in that kind of activity. And, and I wonder if you, if you all could talk a little bit about um, different ways to think about how people contribute to these projects and ways that we should be ensuring that we're valuing people's time. I think, you know, as I, I accidentally started becoming a contributor in some way, and I had to, um, I, I started with administrative um, contributions, and I really felt like, oh man, maybe I'm not doing the real, con you know, maybe I'm not a real contributor because I'm not doing, you know, the pull requests and the, um, and the issues and fixing stuff in the code and whatever, and I, I really had to unlearn that and. Um, I, the P5JS project with everyone who really makes that project, the project really taught me that, um, you know, the aspects that you can kind of move, you know, move forward into the contributordom or whatever um, are all important um, because, you know, a project can't just run on code folks. Um, people really find their niche and um, whether that's you know, any support role period, um, or even just like being that person who's there um, at all the events, right? Um, I think boundaries and also knowing your strengths are things that can come with time if you're if you've never worked within a community structure before. Um, but that none, none of these contributions are um, disvalued, um, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that that's true everywhere, but hopefully. Um, and that if it doesn't work in one project um, that there is another project out there and that you know the many variety of projects will also necessarily come with different kinds of ways to be a contributor. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's super important. I think um, Lauren McCarthy with P5GS uh, really defined that project in a way of thinking about contributions. Um, it you know like beyond the code and so long we've dealt with this notion of open source as a gift from some smart guy, typically. Uh, and he's sort of like granted it upon the world and other people are probably helping, but he's the genius who's made this thing. And um, everybody should just like, you know, wait for him to grant you with new gifts. And, um, and every other kind of contribution is sort of like a bonus. Um, and uh, so uh, turning that around and saying like, actually, the people who are making the code are, you know, important and they're doing important work, but so are the people that are writing uh, documentation. So are the people who are making tutorials. 
So are the people who are teaching other people about this tool. So are the people who are giving money to the tool. Uh, and so are the people who are just like advocating or interested. You know, this makes up an entire ecosystem of contribution to what makes a tool viable and healthy and sustainable. Um, and so um, that changing that notion has been really so, so important. Um, and the primary work of COSA, frankly, um, because uh, these, these projects can't exist. Uh, and we've seen it time and time again, these projects cannot exist with just like the sole genius who's, you know, carrying the whole cross up the mountain and, and won't let anybody help. Uh, and, and then they burn out and then the project just falls flat because, he's, because they've never trained anybody else or prepared anybody else to be part of the leadership of the project. And so thinking about how to diffuse these and make them more of a community effort um, assures that um, and they actually talked a lot about something called the bus factor. Like if one person was hit by a bus, would this tool disappear? Uh, and like how many people would be hit by a bus before the project would be disappear is the, is the health of the project. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so for folks, we've got a question here from, from the audience and, and curious if you can talk a little bit about um, how, how your work and how others who are working with these tools, creating artwork with these tools, um, what are the media sources, sources of information that, that are covering uh, this space for folks who want to learn about it? Where do they go to start? digging in and, and finding out about projects? Are, are there go-to spots? I mean, yeah. Um, I've, you know, I feel like open source is funny because you can, you know, be reading something in, you know, the cut or, you know, just like any media source and, and maybe they're talking about these things you don't know that they're open source um, because of that thing that I was talking about of like, you know, there are, well, maybe actually I didn't say it, but there are large corporations that use these open source tools and you may just ne literally never know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but also it, it's kind of where this is just like, you can't be afraid to talk to human beings that are there. I mean, I think most, most open source folks have GitHub or some kind of repository where their code lives and there's necessarily folks moderating that. And there are forums and things like this, and they can definitely be incredibly daunting, especially depending on what project you're actually interested in knowing more about um, because of, you know, racism, misogyny, and all of the stuff that we love <laughs> to love, would love to get rid of um, in, in the world. Um, but I think, you know, every community has that kind of entry tax in, in some way, um, but, you know, to learn about it for real, I think um, getting your hands kind of dirty in that that community is the best way, or at least that's what I would say to my students. Th thinking about one of those entry taxes, it seems that coding itself can be uh, one of those uh, gateways to entry for, for digital art making. What recommendations do you have for folks who don't code, who still, who want to make digital art and want to fool around with digital tools, where, where might they start uh, to, to create things? I mean, one of the obvious ones is, you know, one of the friendliest points of entry really is P5JS, uh, the project we've been talking about. Uh, I believe that's at p5js.org, is that correct? And um, they, uh, they've put a lot of energy into having, you know, learning resources there on the web page. Um, you know, uh, if you want to see somebody super energetic and excited about uh, teaching coding and who does it really well, uh, Daniel Schiffman has a series online called uh, The Coding Train. Um, and so if you look up Coding Train on YouTube, you can find his tutorials about using P5JS. Um, he, his energy is super infectious and you can't help but have fun with him. And I think, I mean, everybody I talk to is like, oh, you learned to code from Daniel Schiffman too? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we all learned to code from Dan Daniel Schiffman. And, um, you know, I think you also see Daniel's influence in like new, yeah. new tutorial makers as well. Um, 
Yeah, uh, and one thing about, I think we would be sort of sad not to um, mention P5JS's community statement. Um, that community statement is the one that I use in every single classroom that I have, regardless of whether it's like a digital classroom or not. Um, and it's, you know, community edited, community um, really like kind of watched over in some ways and make sure that we're all sort of treating each other in a, in a certain way. Um, but that's also another way that you can kind of judge the, the, um, the environment of a certain project too. Is like, look at, do they have a community statement? Is our folks easy to contact? Um, things like this. And you'll really, you know, get to know the, like, the flags and the, and, the, and the vocabulary of certain communities that way. Well, well that's great. Um, well, we are, we are out of time, unfortunately, but I wanted to end uh, the program with a little bit of a preview of a clip from uh, the, the COSA Connector series. Um, and I want to thank you both, uh, Shanae and Chris. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, thank you for, for talking about uh, th this work and really, you know, the generous spirit that goes into all of it and thinking about community and, and making things and putting things into the world. Um, you know, I, I think this video clip is a really great place to stop because we've been talking about what are the ways you can contribute. Um, and we just talked about Daniel Schiffman and uh, the really wonderful things he has sort of kicked off with the kinds of tutorials he did. Uh, and so I think this is a great place to end it. Uh, thank you both. And uh, for folks who enjoyed this kind of program, uh, we encourage you to tune in uh, next week. Our, our guest will be Laura Zabel, who will be talking to Victoria Rogers. Um, and there are back issues and recordings of all of the uh, programs that we've done over at kf.org slash discovery. And thanks to the uh, team who's helped produce this um, and uh, everyone who's put work into the project. And so now just to leave you all with something really special here. Uh, this is from the COSA Connector series. Shanae McLean Holloway here and I'm a new media artist and poet and just general kind of noise maker and this is an episode of COSA Connectors and this series me and a few friends are showing off our favorite open source tools to make art with and just get generally creative. In addition to being a new media artist I'm also a professor so a lot of these tools are the same ones that I'm using in the classroom. Let me show you a few. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Twine. And Twine, T-W-I-N-E, is a choose-your-own-adventure game engine. This is also sometimes talked about as electronic literature. And electronic literature and games both have been a part of computing history forever. And so I really cherish Twine as a program that can both teach folks about the internet and its relationship to the printed book and the things that words and text really bring to the life of the internet. Twine provides a background of CSS and HTML, and you can really get really fancy with JavaScript and other kinds of coding languages. And the community, which is huge, and it's really popular within queer gaming circles, uses this on all levels. You'll see really popular games that are just text and a color, all the way to full-on experiences where things move across the page and music follows you wherever you go. The nice thing about Twine is it's super beginner friendly, whether you're a, an advanced programmer or someone who's never even been on the internet before, there's going to be something for you in this particular software. The thing about Twine is because we're writing stories, you don't necessarily have to deal with any of the code that other users that might be on the advanced side might want to get into. So if you're working with a group, it's a really great way to accommodate different skill levels. If you're a beginner, you can really focus on your story and make sure that you have the best narrative possible. And if you're advanced, you can work with JavaScript and CSS to make sure that you have the right environment for that story. Twine is also really great for visual learners and those who are learning narrative structures. Because Twine has both a story mode and a preview mode, 
we get to understand how our code, the stuff in the editor, then functions visually in our story mode and how it's translated into preview mode. For those of us learning narrative structures, we get to plan out exactly where we want our story to go. The interface is super flexible. You get to move each of these little squares, known as passages, around the screen, positioning them wherever you like. To use Twine, we can access it through an app or through the browser. Twine's information is always saved in the browser cache, which means if you clear the cache or the memory that you store on your computer locally, your story won't be there. Sometimes that's a little unstable, but what it does is it creates a really agile workflow. Through the app, you'll see that you can create libraries full of awesome stories to share. The role Twine can play is to be able to give you agency and control over your story as folks on the other side of the computer screen interact with you, but only on your terms. I said earlier that Twine has a really beautiful, thriving community. Well, I'm thinking maybe this is why. Sometimes the games community relies on agency and choice to be able to share stories that reflect our values and desires. Twine also really brings a lot to the conversation of consent. Twine gives us those important conversations about consent and control that everybody in the technology world should think about. Great. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thank you both so much. And uh, again, thanks to the team for putting this together. Um, what a wonderful way to, to, to end things. And now I'm going to go play with Twine. I'm going to go listen to Megan the Stallion and Jamila Woods. Hi, so I uploaded the YouTube tutorial for my Twine 1.1. So yesterday on yeah, YouTube. So if you're very curious, go watch my YouTube video. Don't judge me too hard. <laughs> awesome. Again, thank you uh, to, to our guests, Shane and Chris, and get out there, get coding, get making things, uh, and use open source tools. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>